Question actually, two questions from the gentleman there. Very qualified actually, got them started. And uh, there was uh, one additional uh, clear inquiry made right here. Uh, question is uh, uh, if you could talk about types of protein which are the best uh, within the daily diet, within the daily intake, uh, how much time it actually takes to digest the actual proteins, and what is the amount of protein that the body can actually digest when, when consuming it. And uh, then the question added was, uh, what is actually your best practice that you would recommend? It's okay. You see, I said earlier, each individual is different. But, you know, if we got to talk like in ballpark, you know, how much you should have a protein at one seating, I don't suggest more than, you know, maybe 30 to 40 grams of protein, you know. Of course, that's for male. And the reason why I say that, because if you're not blessed with good metabolism, you know, people need to understand. If you have protein, like, like I said, you have 40 grams of protein, for example, and then you end up having two cups of rice, right? So you have about, you know, 70 grams of carb, 40 grams of protein. And if you're not one of the blessed guys, and you can only handle about 30 grams, for example, protein, the extra 10 gram, you know, it's a lot faster to turn into glycogen. We all know protein can, you know, turn into glycogen. And from that, plus the 70 grams you take, if your body cannot absorb all that carb, it's going to turn into fat. And when you eat a lot of protein, remember, please, to drink a lot of water because the protein can become, become toxic to your, you know, kidneys. So it's very important if you take protein, a lot of protein to drink a lot of water with it. So it's hard to tell you, you know, how much protein without you working with me, you know, or working with somebody so he can like get to know your body. Or you can like start trying, you know, on yourself, see how much, you know, start, I'll, I'll start with the lower end, maybe 25, 30 grams, every two and a half to three hours. The reason why I say every two and a half to three hours, because, you know, you have an amino acid pool in your body. And when your muscles go look for that, you know, pool, if it's empty, you start losing your muscles a lot faster than the fat for energy. Like we said, the muscles can transfer into sugar. So that's why it's very important to remember every two and a half to three and a half hours, make sure you have something with protein so you keep your amino acid, you know, full. And like I said, I'm talking bodybuilding. We're not talking about an average people. Average people, they can eat whatever they want. Right? But if you want to become a successful bodybuilder, every two and a half to three and a half maximum hours you should have some type of protein. It doesn't matter what protein you like, it's all good protein, as long as you have, of course, you know, like complete amino acid. So, I mean, you can have beans for protein, but it's not going to be complete amino acid until you mix it with rice. And a lot of people, they might think this is funny, but if you mix beans and rice that become actually com complete amino acid, you see what I'm saying? So there's a lot of stuff you can do without, you know, it's not necessary you have to eat the chicken, but not necessary you have to eat the steak. My preference, you know, especially in the off season, you know, to mix all different type of protein so your body can be happy, your muscles can be happy to choose different protein, you know, instead of being chicken breast, chicken breast, chicken, no. I don't like that. I like all different type of proteins so your body actually keep growing. You know, the better mix you give it, the more growth you're going to have. Okay, what was the other question? What was the best breakfast? Oh, the best breakfast? I don't know. The, the best breakfast? You know, with what I like, I like steak, eggs, and oatmeal. This is my breakfast. And sometimes some toast and I add apple juice. I give him cranberry juice. Like this. <laughs> but this is what I like. I like steak and eggs. Just got to set us a pika. Close, close, you have all your ears. Now, can you do that? This, this is with no disrespect at all. But Kai, why, why do you as a top pro athlete feel that you need a diet coach? Oh, well. Oh, easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, first let me just say uh, thank you for posing the question to me. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you, George, for allowing me to come and just kind of sit in here. This is this is a wonderful opportunity and an honor to do this. Um, 
You know, I was I was talking with someone just recently, and uh, I am just reminded by this question um, when we were over in Italy, we had San Marino. I remember the same question came up, and surprisingly enough, this a question like this will come up very, very, very often. Um, so it's um, it, it's a commonplace question, and I have to say this just in all honesty: um, the best in the world. Uh, those that aspire to do great things in their sport um, have the opportunity or seek the opportunity to find counsel. Um, and the counsel that, that you seek out um, is very, very important, critically important um, um, for you to get the assistance necessary to go beyond what you know, beyond what you're comfortable with, and actually go beyond that and, and reach towards greatness. Um, Tiger Woods, you know, has a coach. You know, um, there are people that um, are just incredible at what they do when we talk about being able to point out keen insights that can help someone who is already um, prepared to listen, um, prepared to use the information um, to go beyond where they are and actually reach further towards the greatness. So to answer your question, it's, it's just very, very obvious and very, very simple. Um, to be the best, um, it's very, very important to seek out the right counsel that can um, help direct you um, with keen insights. That's just, just very, very important. That's one thing. Another thing I want to say is, is that there are people behind the scenes that become the heroes that are unsung in this experience. Um, in other words, the work that they do, a lot of times they're not able to get the credit for just because um, the nature of, the, per the very personal nature um, of, of what it is that they are able to help you with. Um, believe it or not, this gentleman just spoke a little bit earlier about another gentleman in this sport who um, had to deal with some issues with his, with his kidneys, you know. And um, anytime, you talk, anytime you start to talk about a person's health um, behind the scenes and concerns um, related to it, you know, it's, 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 it's personal and um, it's sensitive. You know, it's a very sensitive matter. So when you have somebody that can step into a situation like that in the role of a guide and be able to help you make some critical decisions that will help you not only reach your best in the performance aspect of what you're trying to do, but to also help you do it in a way that is very, very, very safe um, and sparing on your internal organs and things so that you're able to experience a better quality of life after the stage. I mean, you know, the rewards are just, just, just beyond measure. And that's, that's really what we want to do. We want to be able to do this in a way that is safe, in a way that's a lot more sane, and um, in a way that is just, you know, all, all beneficial. The sport is able to benefit from people like that. They're able to make the contributions behind the scenes and help the athletes make these decisions um, in a way that's going to help them be very, very, very safe. You know, and that's, that's just a very important thing. So, to answer your question, uh, there's a lot of reasons that you would um, uh, seek somebody out with the knowledge and insight um, that George Farrar has. And I, I consider myself to be very privileged um, to be exposed to that. And um, the success that we've been able to experience in the last four years, you know, has been a testament to some of that goodness behind the scenes. <coughs> some are some, some uh, also the uh, absolute country. Last question. I'm going to be short and carry them, choose if you want to answer short or not, so that's your problem. Um, uh, my question is uh, the stunt you did last year, uh, signing some uh, posters that you were going to be Mr. Olympia. What, what, why, was, uh, why did you do that stunt? What was the purpose behind that? Well, you know, if anyone is hearing this and it's not quite clear what the stunt is, Basically, I, think, I believe you're talking in reference to Kai Green signing a poster um, as uh, Mr. Olympia 2000, so-and-so at that particular time at a press conference or something like that. I think it was, um, 
a day or two before the actual ex competition experience was about to happen. So that's what happened, and he's asking me about that now. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, 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 I'm a dotaz je, proč KG podepisoval plakáty dva dny před vlastní soutěží mistrů Olympie 2013 s tím, že je mistr Olympie. So sometimes people refer to this as a stunt because they, some people might read it out of context and think, oh, the nerve of you, you know, how dare you, you know, speak of something to happen before it does. But is it any more odd to do something like that when you talk about the growth of your son? When you say you look at him at five, and you look at him at seven, and you look at him at eight, and you look at him at 13, and you look on proudly and you say to him, that's going to be a great man someday. If someone were to challenge that, you would think them to be crazy. I believe my son will be a great man because I expect to do the work necessary to help him develop the strength of character and personality so that he will one day become the very thing that I say. Not because of being arrogant, but because you know that your thoughts become things and you recognize that it's your job to do the work necessary to make it happen. That day in question, was not a stunt of arrogance. It wasn't a stunt at all. It was a, a declaration. It was a man saying, I declare before you see it that I will call into existence this day. I believe that I have put together the necessary tools in my camp that have afforded me the opportunity to the right guidance and to do the necessary work that will allow me to one day see my dream realized. That's not an arrogant statement at all. That is a man standing firm in his belief that I can make my dream happen. So what happened was, you know, someone else might have felt like that was a step on their toes, but it wasn't. You know, the crown of that year had not been awarded to anyone yet. And I had come there firmly and boldly to declare that I was ready, and I am ready, to step forward and to see my dream realized. Not because I expect someone to give it to me, but because I am believing that my team and I, behind the scenes, are ready and willing to do the work necessary to make it happen. No step on anyone's toes. <laughs> Is it, is it available? Is the questions and answers. Thank you, Kai, for your insight, not only on that event. And thank you, George Farah, for all the insights and for all the great answers to the questions posted by the great audience. Thank you. Thank you.